Chapter 25 is really the most important chapter of David's life. It's where he's going to change. He's going to stop being just the boy with promise. He's going to stop being the servant who's been wrong. He's going to stop being the person that God has anointed. And this is the chapter where he becomes a man of God. When I say this to you, that this chapter is one of the most important chapters in David's life, and I think it's one of the most important chapters in America's life, because what America needs is more men. Not boys who shave, not men who live in their mommy's basement, but men who have character and integrity, much like David. Amen? Amen. When did it all change? <clears throat> when did it all change in my life that it used to be a chair... And sitting down was a punishment. Oh, I was raised in a generation that didn't do time out. <laughs> I wish there was time out when I was a kid. I'd be in prison now if they had had it, but my parents just beat me. But when did it go that having to sit in a chair was a punishment? People told you to sit down as a kid. People told you to wait. They put you in there to sit in the corner and think about your actions, young man. When did it go from being a punishment to being the greatest joy of my life? <laughs> I love to sit. In fact, this people often ask me, what's your hobby? And it's very difficult for me to tell them that my hobby is sitting. I have a recliner that pops up and my feet go up. I have a little ottoman. If I don't like the recliner, if I still want to rock and put my feet, I can do that too in my house. And that's my chair. My kids know if they sit there and touch anything, Dad's going to come and talk to them. <clears throat> in fact, if they had an Olympic sport, and I had petitioned the, the Olympic Committee to make sitting an official Olympic sport. Because somehow along the line of my life, this went from a punishment to the greatest joy I have in my life. And something else has changed, I've noticed in my life, that being the youngest of seven of a large family, we produced a lot of garbage. And my job growing up was to take the trash out. Now let me remind them, know this, that I didn't live in a, a, a small house with the front of the yard and real small. And I didn't live in a large uh, plot of land for our suburban neighborhood. And my dad, being the person that he was, made us put all the garbage behind our pool in the backyard. And we had to take it all the way from the back and carry it all the way to the front and put it by the curb for the garbage men to get. And we had to do it in the winter. It did not matter if it was one degree. It did not matter if it was two. I'm sort of falling into Dr. Seuss here. But this was my responsibility. And you know what's interesting? When me and my brother moved out, got married and moved out, my dad did two things. Well, three things. First, of that big yard, he bought a riding lawnmower. <laughs> that long driveway that was like 40 yards long, he bought a snowblower. And the other thing he did... He got one of those real nice big containers with big wheels. We didn't have a garbage can. We had garbage bags. And if you didn't do it right with a garbage bag, it broke. And if you broke it and there was a trail of garbage down there, Bruce Sheridan would see it and make you go back and pick it up. He got one of those big containers with big fancy wheels. And he built this thing right next to the house where he could put the garbage so that you could just walk right out of the house, drop your garbage in, and when time came, you could just sort of pull it down to the yard. After we moved out. But see, something happened to this too in my life. This used to be my responsibility. And then I got my own boy. <laughs> and now it's his responsibility. In fact, I haven't put garbage out in years. It was a great day. It was a great day a few years ago when I resigned and handed over my shovel and said, here you are. Welcome to manhood, to my boy. And it was a great day many years ago when I told him he is now in charge of the garbage. And now that he's 14, sometimes he tends to forget. It was just this week on Tuesday morning when I woke up and thought, oh, he didn't put the garbage out. I forgot to remind him Monday night, and it didn't get put out. And I looked out there at like 8 in the morning, and I saw he just left for school, and I looked, and there were empty garbage cans in the front of my yard because my son had remembered on his own to take the garbage out, and the garbage men had come and left it. And I kid you not, that evening when he came home and I saw him from school, and I said, you remembered the garbage, didn't you? I grabbed him and I hugged him. And I said, I'm so proud of you for remembering the garbage. And he just looked at me like a 14-year-old and thought his dad needs better medication. But <clears throat> when did it change that my desires and my priorities have completely become different? If you're taking notes today, I do have a point. And it's this. 
Help me out, Bill. Our one simple truth is this. To become a man of God, I must change my desires and priorities. Listen, to become a man of God, I must change my desires and priorities. There are desires and priorities when I was young, and they need to change. And that's the problem with most men today. The same desires and priorities they had at 14 are the same they had when they're 24. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I have a problem with 30-year-old men who think the best, best thing of their life is to play Xbox. Now, I'm not up here preaching against video games and saying they're bad, but please, listen, what I used to think was important when I was 16, when I turned 36, it changed. Amen? Because there is a difference between the desires and the priorities of a man and the desires and the priorities of a boy. God expects us to change as believers. If you're taking notes, God expects us to change as believers because He is unchangeable. It is because He is an unchangeable force. He is a rock. He does not alter his character, his priorities, because he does not change, and he is always there. I can base every value, every decision, every judgment on the unchangeable movement of God. So today we see this, the changes that David will have to make. In 1 Samuel 22, David has attached himself with a group of discontented, in debt, looking for a leader group of men. And he is hid out in chapter 25. He is hiding out from Saul. And he is in the same area of Nabal's sheep. And these desperate men in a desperate situation conduct themselves with honor. They have nothing to lose at this point. They could very easily kill some of Nabal's sheep and eat them for themselves. They have swords. They're good with it. Nabal has no army. But instead, they conduct themselves with honor and character. And in by doing so, being around Nabal's sheep, they not only don't touch Nabal's sheep, but they end up protecting his sheep. And because of this, Nabal will prosper. Having no sheep being taken away by people going by and, and rustlers, having no sheep being taken away by animals, his sheep begin to prosper, and he has more and more and more, and he's getting richer and richer because David is doing the right thing. David is not concerned about what Nabal thinks. He's concerned about what God thinks. And because of this, this group of desperate men who have every reason on paper to go and kill some of these sheep, they do the right thing, and Nabal is getting wealthier and wealthier because of David's presence. So David will go to Nabal and ask for some help from him. And because of this, David will have to change his priorities and his desires. And the first thing that will change is this, if you're taking notes. What he thinks brings peace. What he thinks brings peace. Nabal thinks, David thinks that Nabal is just like him. David thinks Nabal is a man of character. Nabal never asked David to take care of his sheep, never asked him to do any of this, but David did it simply because it was the right thing to do. And so David assumes, hey, I did the right thing, I'm a man of character, Nabal also will be a man of character, and he will pay me back and help me out in this time of need that I have. He thinks he's a man of peace. Why? Because at this moment, David is at peace with God. Watch how he talks to him, verse 6. And thus shall ye say unto him, he's sending his men to talk to Nabal, saying to him, that liveth in prosperity, what kind of he says, he says it three times in this verse, peace be both unto thee, and peace be to thy house, and peace be to all that thou hast. Nabal is not a man at peace. Can I tell you why he's not a man at peace? He's not a man at peace because he is not at peace with God. Listen, you get your relationship with God wrong, and you will get every other relationship with your life wrong. Amen? And the very first relationship you need to come into peace with is God, and the only way you will appease, the only way you can stand before God right, is by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. May I suggest to you that I can baptize you any, as many times as you wish. It will never wash away one sin. You can give money to the church. Wouldn't hurt. You can get money to the church. You can do all sorts of nice things for the pastor. <laughs> Somebody say amen. <laughs> you can do all sorts of things. But until you realize that you are a sinner separated from God, you are at war with God by just simple fact that you were born, 
But God loved you so much that He sent His Son to die on a cross for you. And on the third day, because He was God and died for your sins, Jesus rose on the third day. Until you accept that, until you make a personal decision to ask Him to be the Lord of your life, you will never be at peace with God. And that's why you're struggling. That's why issues come and you go up and down. You're like a ship in the midst of a storm. Your relationship with God is not at peace. And by the way, believer, you've accepted Jesus, you said a prayer, you asked Him to be Lord of your life, you're born again. But you're still not at peace with God. May I suggest to you that you haven't surrendered to Him. You haven't given over to whatever He would have you to do, whatever He would need from you. You are still holding back part of your life, part of your heart, and saying, this is still mine. Now watch the contrast here. David is running for his life. David is sleeping in a cave. He is looking over his shoulder. And he looks and he sees Nabal. Nabal has a beautiful home. Nabal sleeps and, and has a comfortable bed. Nabal has everything anybody would think was perfect. And Nabal also has this beautiful, loving, kind wife, Abigail. So David assumes he must be at peace. David has to change a few things because he makes a mistake about peace. David thinks this peace comes through prosperity. Look at verse 6. And thus shall you say unto him that liveth in prosperity, peace. As a nation, we are a prosperous nation. I realize we've had hard economic times right now. But I want you to understand something. If you have indoor plumbing, you are part of the chosen few of, of the world. Amen? If you have clean, steady water, you are part of a small minority, a small minority in the world. The poorest person in America is richer than most people throughout the entire world. You may think you're having a hard time. You may think you're going through a difficult time because you're struggling to pay your bills. You're struggling to pay your mortgage. And the rest of the world would think, you have a house? You have a car? You have shoes? You have all of these things. Listen, we are a nation of prosperity. Even the poorest person in this country can say they are prosperous by the world standard. But are we a nation of peace? It would not be a word that describes. In fact, I'll suggest this to you. Having lived with and ministered with some very wealthy people, I'll suggest this to you, that the wealthier you get, the more things you get, the less peace you have. Some of the most miserable people I have ever met are people with a big bank account. Are people with lots of stuff. Let me remind you, prosperity will not bring peace to you. The second mistake he makes about peace is property. Look back at verse 6. Be both to thee and peace to thine house. Now, anyone can buy a house, but it takes love and time to build a home. David mentions this, your house. Where is David sleeping? I mean, he's sleeping out on a rock and in a cave, and, and he's sleeping with these 400 men, and that ain't cool. Listen, I was, I, I was my last year in college, and one of the reasons I decided to get married, one, I knew she was the right girl, but I got tired of living in a dorm on the floor with 40 other dudes, man. It ain't cool. And here's David living outside in a, a rock and, and in a cave and living with all these other sweaty, disgusting men. And he sees Nabal. Nabal's got this nice, comfortable house. He must be happy. He must be at peace because he has property. And the third thing David mistakes peace for is possessions. Last part of that verse. And peace be unto all that thou hast. Can I remind you of this? Possessions don't bring peace. What you do with them brings peace. Here's a little joke. That means you've got to laugh. It's in the Bible somewhere. The crumbling old church building needed remodeling. So the preacher made an impassioned appeal, looking directly at the richest man in town. At the end of the message, the rich man stood up and announced, Pastor, I will contribute $1,000. Just then, plaster from the ceiling fell and struck the man on the shoulder. He promptly stood up again and said, Pastor, I will increase my donation to $5,000. And before he could sit down, another piece of plaster from the ceiling fell off and hit him on the head. And at that moment, he stood back up and said, Pastor, I will now give $20,000. Which prompted one of the deacons in the back to stand up and say, Hit him again, Lord! Hit him again! <laughs> Everything you have, 
You have because God gave to you. You don't like this earth? Get your own planet. You don't like how this universe is created, the laws and the spiritual laws? Get your own universe. You don't like the life you have? Get your own oxygen. Everything you have, from your family, to your bank account, to the gifts and talents you have, God gave you. How you bless God is by what you do with it. Your time, your energy, your strength, and even your checkbook. The second thing David will have to change, number two, what he expects of character. Um, when you don't have character, you think no one else does. Do you want to know what someone is willing to do? Do you want to know what someone is willing to do? Watch what they are willing to accuse other people of doing without proof. If you want to know what somebody else... Listen, every liar thinks everyone's a liar. Every thief thinks everyone's a thief. And every politician thinks you're stupid. Because they too are stupid. Watch. Watch what people are willing to accuse without proof. That is what they're willing to do when no one is looking. David is a man of character, and he assumes Nabal will have character. Look at verse 7. And now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds, which were with us, we hurt them not. I, I didn't hurt any of the shepherds. I didn't hurt any of your sheep. And neither were there aught missing unto them. Not one sheep was missing the time we were here, Nabal. And while they were in Carmel, David's men never touched anything that belonged to Nabal. Why? Because he had enough character to do the right thing. You want to know your mark of your character? You want to know where you are as far as the character scale? If you have great character or little character? What are you willing to do? And nobody would ever find out. If given the opportunity to never be punished, to never be given an account that your mother would never know, that your husband would never know, that your wife would never know, what are you willing to do? Listen, if your wife would never know on that business trip that you slept around and, and cheated on her, would you do it? If the boss would never know that he doesn't have accounts of it, but you took out money from the till or embezzled it, if nobody would ever know, that's your character. Young people, if your parents could never find out, what are you willing to do today? That is the mark of your character. David has assumed everyone has character, and he assumed everyone will keep their word. Uh, young people, this is a lesson today I wish you didn't have to learn. I hate to have to open your eyes to this, but not everyone is a good person. Amen, adults? Most people, listen to me, young people, most people will disappoint you. Most people are selfish. But can I remind you of this, young people? You are not here to serve others. You are not here to even serve you. You are here by your actions and your character to honor God. You don't do right because people are watching you. You don't do right because you'll have to give an account. You don't do right because the police will come and arrest you. You don't do right because your parents tell you to. You do right, not even because it helps and benefits you. You do right because it honors God. And let me remind you this, young people. The world has very little expectation of you. They tell it to you in their movies. They show it to you in their TV shows and the music. They have little expectation. They think that you're an animal who will go and reproduce and, and have sexual relations with anybody who comes along. They think that all you're interested in is getting high because everybody smokes weed. They think that all you care about is getting drunk on the weekends, everything. The world has very little expectation for you. But I want to remind you something I do. Amen. And I want to tell you something else. Your parents have a high expectation for you. And ultimately, even more than them, God has a high expectation for you. I used to teach young people. I taught students for 13 years. And every now and then the topic of dating would come along and premarital sex and everything. I used to tell teenage boys this. You, you know, oh, we got all control. We couldn't control ourselves. And I said, if I was in the room, you could control yourself. <laughs> well, but, yeah, no, no. If I was in, so what I want you to do, next time you think you can't control yourself, Think of this face. It's the biggest mood killer on the planet. But young people, I suggest to you, even before you think of this face, 
Before you think of having to stand before a group of people and tell them you did the wrong thing. Before you have to make them pay the consequences of your actions. Before you have to concern yourself with what your parents think. May I suggest to you that you concern yourself with what God in heaven thinks about you. Amen? You see, if you're only concerned about me and your parents, one day, as we've seen in verse 1, one day your spiritual leader will die. And then what? Number three, David will have to change what he expects from doing right. Look at verse 8. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. They are reminding Nabal. He's sending messengers to remind them that, hey, uh, when his workers were there, not only did we not touch them, but we also protect them. And if he's not sure about it, feel free to talk to anybody out there. They will tell you the same, Nabal. Verse 8, Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh into thy hand, unto thy servants, to thy son. That David's not asking for a lot. He's just saying, could you give us a little meat? Could you give us something to drink and help us out a little? It's kind of been a tough time. Maybe it's a difficult time uh, during the, the, the process, and some of the brooks have dried up, and some of the food they were eating is gone. The deer have run off, and they, they're just, they just need a little helping hand from Nabal. That's all he's asking for. Verse 9, And when David's young men came, and they spake to Nabal accordingly to all these words of David, and they ceased. David is under, operating under an old idea, and that is no good deed goes unrewarded. But David is a man of character, and Nabal isn't. Nabal is operating under a new idea. No good deed goes unpunished. The one important thing I want you to know about good deeds, if you're taking notes, is this. Good deeds often go unrewarded. Do them anyways. Good deeds often go unrewarded. Do them anyways. If you do the right thing to be rewarded, you will be let down. And I can think of no one that does the right thing, no relationship that emphasizes that more than a mother. After going through the mosque classes with his expected wife, the proud new father reminded her, re re remained by her bedside throughout the labor process and delivery, and wanted to be sympathetic as possible. He took his wife's hand afterward and said emotionally, Tell me. How was it, darling? How it exactly felt to give birth? Okay, honey, his wife replied. Smile as hard as you can. Beaming down at his wife and smiling, the man followed her instructions. He said, well, that's not that hard. She continued. Now stick a finger in each corner of your mouth. The man obeyed simply and smiled broadly. Now stretch your lips as far as possible they can go, she went on. The man said, well, this isn't that bad. It's not too tough. And the woman said, okay, now... Take your lips and pull them over your head. <laughs> no one sacrifices more in a relationship and expects nothing like a mother. Amen, ladies? But that's the mentality that God wants us to have. Willing to do anything and expect no reward. You see, we keep expecting a reward for doing what we're supposed to do. I mean, we show up at church and we think God will bless us this week. I show up at church. Can I remind you, you're supposed to show up at church. We give and, and we give an offering, we give our tithe and we think, well, God will bless me because of you're supposed to do that. Well, Pastor, I did something amazing and, and the Holy Spirit helped me. I was able to forgive somebody who had wronged me for years. Can I just tell you this? You're supposed to forgive. We expect and do what we're supposed to, and we expect a reward for that. Gentlemen, you know not to do this. You know not to show up and say, well, I'm here. I, I worked all week. I did this. I came home. I loved you. So I expect you, wife, to do things for me. No, listen, sir. You're supposed to go from work to home and not to the bar. You're supposed to not cheat on your wife. You're supposed to, as much as you possibly can, provide for your family. You're supposed to not get high this week. You're supposed to love your wife and be the role model to your children. You're supposed to do that. You don't get a reward for doing the supposed to's in life. David is doing what he's supposed to do. He's doing the right thing, and he's going to have to learn this, that not every good deed will get rewarded. You do it all. You know why? Because when I do what I'm supposed to do, not for a reward, not for recognition, not for anything else, but I do it because it pleases my Lord and Savior. Amen. That and that alone. Listen, part
part of worship is praise. I get that. It's part of his praise. It's also tithing. It's also reading your Bible. These are all parts of worship. And one of the greatest ways you praise God is every day getting up and doing the supposed to's. He said, Pastor, I love the song. Man, great worship we had today. I loved it too. Pastor Dave sang a song and led one at the 9 o'clock hour and did something amazing. A miracle took place here. I was speechless. <laughs> Couldn't say a word. Didn't sing one part of it. The words were beautiful, that song. Just listening to it just moved me and I could feel God. Listen, we love that. We love the praise part. But I'm going to tell you something that gives God more praise is when you do the supposed to's in your life. Anyone can raise their hand. Anyone can sing a song. But it takes a man to be a father. Sir, do the supposed to's in your life. And God will start blessing you. Especially if you seem upset. Because I am tired. I am tired of the condition our country is in. Because we have too many boys who shave that are going around masquerading as men and not doing the supposed to's in their life. And expecting that they do something. Well, I must get rewarded for this. Let me tell you something, sir. You may never get rewarded for doing the right thing. But you do the right thing because it honors God. And you claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ. May I suggest that your faith is weak because you do not have enough faith to do right. Even though you don't get rewarded. Amen? Well, that's some hard preaching. Who showed up today? Number four. Help me out, Bill. Number four. What David will have to change is who he turns to for help. Remember, Nabal's name means brute fool. We told you last week if we gave you a new name for Nabal, a current name, we would say jerk. Because that's exactly what Nabal is. See how true this is. Watch Nabal's answer. Here's verse 10. And Nabal answered David's servant and said, Who is David? <laughs> who is the son of Jesse? You know who they are, Nabal. They were the ones out there protecting your sheep and doing what the right thing was. They were protecting your men from raiders and from uh, pilferers who would take them. You know exactly who David is. There's nobody in that nation who didn't know who David is. The Goliath, the giant killer, that's who David is. There have been many servants nowadays that break away. Every man from his master, he's taking a shot at David saying, this is what you are against Saul. You're running against Saul. Verse 11, shall I take my bread? and my water, and my flesh, that I have killed for my shearers, and given unto men, whom I know not whence they be. I read this, and I'm not shocked. I've been alive long enough to not be shocked at the response of Nabal. I shouldn't be, but I'm not. I'm not surprised that people act this way. Young people, listen. Here's the amazing thing. When you hang out with the wrong crowd, when you finally submit and do what they think you should do, they'll turn on you. They'll turn on you. See, we have a world and a culture that says, sleep around. And when you do and get in trouble, they'll call you a word. Don't believe it? Listen to rap music. They call you a word that all the time. We have a culture that tells you to get eaten and drink and, and everything, and when you get overweight, we'll call you names. We have a culture that thinks it's okay, hey, drink and get high and do all this other stuff, and then when you, it turns into an addiction in your life, they'll turn on you and call you names. Young people, do not be surprised when bad people do bad things. Amen? Do not be surprised when the world turns on you. Young person, you're dating an unsafe person, don't be surprised. Watch the reaction when you go find them to this week and say, you know what, I've decided to take my relationship with God a little more serious. I'm going to take it up and I watch how they turn on you. Young person, you're saved and you're dating a believer who's not a growing Christian. Go to them and tell them, hey, I want to take my faith in Jesus and I want to make it real in my life and I want to start doing more things and I want God to start making decisions in my life. Watch how that backslidden carnal Christian, watch how they turn on you. Don't be surprised when bad people turn on you. The greatest difference between the man of God, David's goal, and the person that Nabal is, is a fool, a man of the flesh. There's two letter word that Nabal uses repeatedly. Look back at verse 11. Four times he's going to use it. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for 
my shares and give them to men who I know not whence they be? See, either you own your life or God does it. A little boy was overheard praying this. Lord, if you can't make me a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a really good time the way I am. And unfortunately, that's the prayer for too many believers, too many churches. God, I know what I'm supposed to be, and I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm having a little too much fun right now. Check back with me later. Your life can change quickly. Last week in Russia, people were going about their normal lives, thinking about God, not thinking about anything, just doing what normal people do in the morning, driving to work. And if you saw the news, there was a video, and a meteorite came through the sky. And it came through, show this video here. Watch this. These are just some of the videos that took place. This is an early morning, and it lit up the sky as this meteorite went through. And thankfully, it landed out in a wilderness area and uh, didn't kill anybody. People were hurt. But they said the impact of it had the impact of greater than the bombs we dropped in Japan all put together. And they said that uh, the impact of it blew out from miles away, blew out windows of buildings and doors of buildings and everything. And what happened is people thought the world was ending. I mean, you saw that shooting across the sky out of nowhere and a gigantic boom taking place. The first thing you think of, the world, the Mayans must have been right. They must have just been off by a month. And they saw this and people said they thought they were under attack. And they thought it was a missile that had flown in that maybe from North Korea or maybe even America that they were at war. They thought everything was coming to an end in their life. See, life can change very quickly. It can change for the good, and it can change for the bad. And I suggest to you that you put your life in control of the God who controls the meteorites. May I suggest to you that you put your life in control of the God who controls when the earth will turn and stop, who controls when the sun will rise and sit down, who in the spoken word created this earth, May I suggest that you put your life in control by the God who gave you breath, by the God who gave you your family, who gave you the ability, who gave you all of your possessions. May I suggest to you that life can change quickly and it can change for the bad, but also when your life is controlled by God, it can change for the good. But he has to have control of your desires and your priorities. And next week, we're going to see an amazing woman as she saves her family and stops David in his tracks. Every head bowed, every eye closed.